pleasure to have you all with us this afternoon. We are going to have such fun today. I want to tell you what this afternoon will not be, and that is an academic dissertation. If there are any Shakespeare scholars in the room, can you maybe not say anything until after it's all over? I've done my research, I think it's solid, but we are here mostly to have an overview between Shakespeare to Sullivan. That's as in Gilbert and Sullivan. As I put the program together, I am indebted to several people. One is Marie Hammond, who is part of the Crowsdale Readers Group, Noelle Paul, who is with the Durham Savo Yards, Sam Hammond is going to be our accompanist today, and I'm also grateful to Shamaya Hart of the Sister City Youth Committee. She is going to be handling our tech this afternoon. So, to open things up, I've got Donna Smith and Joan Whitman, who are going to be doing a song from Kiss Me Kate by Cole Porter, Brush Up Your Shakespeare. Kind audience, did you know that the ladies today in society go for classical poetry? And to win their hearts, one must quote with ease, Aeschylus and Euripides. One must know Homer, Sophocles, Shelley, and Keats. But the poet of them all, who will start up simply raven, is the poet people call the bard of Stratford on Avon. So those of you who want to woo and wow the ladies, let us remind you. Now it's time to test the audience. You didn't know that there was going to be a quiz, did you? 
I'm going to toss out some well-known Shakespearean quotes, and I'd like to see hands and responses from which plays are these? <laughs> to be or not to be? That is the question. Hamlet. Hamlet, of course. <laughs> Romeo, Romeo. <laughs> 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 Romeo and Juliet. Exactly. Now is the winter of our discontent. In the back. Uh, Richard III. Richard III, exactly. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. It was indeed as you like it. I am one who loved not wisely, but too well. Exactly, Othello, yes. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Uh, I've got the tempest. Is that yeah, incorrect? That was right. yeah, okay. that was wrong. Get thee to a nunnery. Hamlet. Hamlet, exactly. <laughs> to thine own self be true. And Hamlet again, yes. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Exactly, exactly. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Richard the third. Richard the third. The fault, dear Brutus, lies not within the stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Caesar, right. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. The Scottish play. Yeah, the Scottish play, which is like that, yeah. Out, damn spot! Out, I say! Same thing. Right, right. But for my own part, this is Greek to me. It's from Julius Caesar. Yeah. My salad day when I was green in judgment. Yeah, yes, and the I have not slept one wink. Simile. <laughs> the course of true love never did run smooth. That's Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah, Midsummer Night's Dream. Right, right. Very good. I haven't been able to stump you too much. What's in a name? A rose by other names. No, 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 no. Julia, of course, of course. Okay. All right. Some are born great. Some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Yes. Oh. Twelfth night, exactly. Yeah. Okay. You all passed. Excellent. <laughs>
He was indisputably the foremost English playwright preceding Shakespeare, and his influence on Shakespeare seems to be just as much personal as it was professional. Shakespeare plays a pays tribute to him in As You Like It, when Rosalind quotes a line from Marlowe's unfinished poem, Hero and Leander. Christopher Marlowe had quite a short life. He was stabbed in the eye, apparently, during a barroom brawl. So um, who knows what else he might have contributed to literature had that not happened. The Crowsdale Readers Group is going to be performing for us, and I am looking forward to this so very much. They will take the stage. Marie Hammond is going to set the scene for us, so if you would please come on up. Good afternoon. At Crowsdale Village Methodist Retirement Community, a group of residents meets weekly to read Shakespeare plays. Currently, the group is reading King Henry IV, Part One, from which we will read you a scene. First, let me introduce the characters. Falstaff is a, <laughs> is a very fat, lazy, witty, foul-mouthed sponger who lives on credit, thievery, and occasional gifts from his friend, Prince Hal. <laughs> is the playboy son of King Henry IV, <laughs> recently reconciled with his father and planning to fight with him against enemies who would depose the king. Prince Hal likes to play jokes on Falstaff and recently picked some papers out of his pocket, uh, but there was no money there. We also have Mistress Quickly. <laughs> who is the innkeeper and she wants to collect what Falstaff owes her for food, lodging, and of course alcoholic drinks. And lastly we have Bardolph, a drinking buddy of Falstaff and the Prince, who shows signs of perpetual intoxication. Notice the red nose. <laughs> Thought off, am I not fallen away vilely since this last action? Do I not bake? Do I not dwindle? Why, my skin hangs about me like an old lady's loose gown. I am withered like an old apple john. Well, I'll repent, and that suddenly, when I'm in some liking, I shall be on heart shortly, and then I shall have no strength to repent, and I have not forgotten what the inside of church is made of. I'm a peppercorn, a brewer's horse, the inside of a church. Well, company, villainous company, has been the spoil of me. Oh, Sir John, you are so fretful, you cannot live long. Oh, well, there it is. Come, <coughs> sing me a body song. Make me merry. I was as virtuously given as a gentleman need to be. Well, virtuous enough. Swore little, <laughs> diced not above seven times a week. Went to a body house not above once a quarter of an hour. I paid money that I borrowed <laughs> three or four times, and I lived well and in good <coughs> compass. And now I live all out of order, all out of compass. <laughs> Why, Sir John, you are so fat, Sir John. You must needs be out of all compass. <laughs> out of all reasonable compass, Sir John. But do thou amend thy face, and I'll amend my life. Thou art our admiral. Thou bearest the lantern and the poop. But tis in the nose of thee, actually. Thou art the knight of the burning lamp. Why, Sir John, my face does you no harm. No, I'll be sworn. I make good use of it, as a man may. Uh, doth of a head, death's head, or memento mori. I never see thy face, but I think upon hellfire, 
and dime of ease that lived in purple. For there he is in his robes, burning, burning. If thou wert any way given to virtue, I would swear by thy face. My oath would be, by this far, that's God's angel. But thou art altogether given over and wert indeed, but for the light of thy face, the son of utter darkness. When thou ranst up Gad's Hill in the night to catch my horse, if I did not think thou hadst been an ignis fatuous or ball of wildfire, there's no purchase in money. Oh, thou art a perpetual triumph and an everlasting bonfire light. Thou hast saved me a thousand marks in links and torches, walking with thee in the night twixt tavern and tavern. But the sack that thou hast dropped would have bought me lights as good cheap at the dearest candles in Europe. I have maintained that salamander of yours with far any time this two and thirty years. God reward me for it. Spud, I would my face were in your belly. God of mercy, I should be sure to be hot burnt. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, now, Dame Tartlet the hen. Have you inquired who yet picked my pocket? Why, Sir John, what do you think, Sir John? Do you think I keep thieves in my house? I have searched. I have inquired. I have, so has my husband, man by man, boy by boy, servant by servant. The tithe of a hair was never lost in my house before. You lie, hostess. Bought off was shaved and lost many a hair, and I'll be sworn my pocket was picked. Go to, you're a woman, go, go. Who, moi? <laughs> <laughs> I have defied God's light. I was never called so in my house, my own house before. Go to, I know you well enough. No, Sir John, you do not know me, Sir John. I know you, Sir John. You owe me money, Sir John. <laughs> And now you pick a quarrel to be guile me of it. I bought you a dozen of shirts. Dowlers. Dowlers. Filthy dowlers. I've given them away to baker's wives. They've made bolters of them. Now, as I am a true woman, <laughs> hauling of eight shillings an ounce, you owe me money here besides, Sir John, for your diet and pie drinking, and money lent you four and twenty pounds. He had his part of it. Let him pay. He, alas, he is poor. He has nothing. How? Poor? Look at his face. What call you rich? Let them coin his nose. Let them coin his cheeks. I'll not pay a denier. What will you make a yonker of me? Shall I take my ease <laughs> and mine how on in, and I shall have my pocket picked? Why, I have lost a seal ring of my grandfather's worth 40 more. Oh, Jesus, well, I have heard the prince tell him I know not how off that that ring was copper. How? <laughs> the prince is a jack, a sneak up. God's blood and he were here. I'd cudgel him like a dog if he would say so. Uh, how now, my lad? Is the wind in that door in faith? Must we all march? Ah, yes, two and two, Newgate, Captain. My lord, I, I pray you hear me. Uh, what, uh, say, mistress, quickly? How doth your husband? I love him well. Good lord, hear me, hear me. Pray thee, let her alone and list to me. What sayest thou, Jack? Why, the other night I fell asleep here behind this arras and had my pocket picked. This house is turned into a body house. They pick pockets. What didst thou lose, Jack? Wilt thou uh, believe me, Hal? Three or four bonds of forty pound apiece and a seal ring of my grandfather's. A trifle. Some eight penny matter. So I told him. So I told him, Master, and I said, I heard your grace say so. And, my lord, he speaks most vilely of you, like a foul mouthed man as he is. And said he would cuddle you. What? He did not. There's neither faith, truth, nor womanhood in me else. 
there's no more faith in thee than a stewed prune, nor no more truth in thee than in a drawn fox. And for womanhood, well, Maid Marion may be the deputy's wife of the ward to thee. Go, you thing. Go. Say, what thing? What thing? What a thing? Why, a thing to thank God on. I am no thing to thank God on. I would thou shouldst know it. I am an honest man's wife, and setting my thy knighthood aside, aside, thou art a knave to tell me so. Setting thy womanhood aside, thou art a beast to say <laughs> otherwise. What beast? What beast, sayest thou? What beast? Why, an otter. An otter? Why an otter? Why, she's neither fish nor flesh. A man knows not where to have her. Thou art an unjust man in saying so. Thou, or any man, knows where to have me. <laughs> thou sayest true, mistress, uh, and he slanders thee most grossly. So he got you, my lord, and late this other day said you owed him a thousand pounds. Sure, do I owe you a thousand pounds? A thousand pound, Hal? Nay, a million. Thy world love is worth a million. <coughs> Thou owest me thy love. Nay, nay, my lord. He called you Jack, and he said he would cuddle you. Did I, Mono? Indeed you did, Sir John. Mm -hmm. Indeed you did. Yes, if he said my ring was copper. I say, tis copper. Why, how thou knowest as thou art a man, I would dare be as good as my word. But as thou art a prince, I fear thee as I fear a roaring uh, lion's wealth. Why not a lion? Well, the king himself is to be feared as the lion. Dost thou think I'll fear thee as I fear thy father? Nay, and I do. I pray God my girdle break. <laughs> oh, if it should, how would thy guts fall about thy knees? But, sir, uh, there's no room for faith, truth, honesty in the bosom of thine. It's all filled with guts and midriff. <laughs> Charge an honest woman with picking thy pocket? Why, thou whoresome, impudent, embossed rascal, if there were anything in thy pocket but tavern reckonings, memorandums of uh, body houses, uh, rec uh, and poor and a poor penny worth of uh, sugar candy to uh, uh, make you long-winded. If thy pocket were enriched with any other injuries but these, I am a villain. And yet you would stand to it. You will not pocket up long. Art thou not ashamed? Dost thou hear how thou knowest? In the state of innocency, Adam fell. And what should poor Jack Falstaff do in these days of villainy? Thou seest I have more flesh than any other man, and am therefore more inclined to frailty. You confess then, you picked my pocket. You appear so by the story. Justice, I forgive thee. Go make ready my breakfast. Love thy husband. Look to thy servants. Cherish thy guest. Thou shalt find me tractable to any honest reason. Thou seest I am pacified still. Nay, prithee, be gone. And now, how? To the news at court for the robbery lad. How is that answered? Thou, uh, my sweet thief, I must be still. <laughs> Good angel to thee, the money is paid back again. Oh, I do not like that paying back. It is a double labor. I'm good friends with my father. I can do anything. Well, then rob me the exchequer. The first thing thou do is, and do it with us washed hands. Oh, too. do my lord, do my lord. <laughs> I have procured thee, Jack, a charge of foot. Well, I would it had been a horse. Where shall I find one that can steal well? Oh, for a fine thief of the age of two and twenty or thereabouts, I'm heinously unprovided. Well, thank God for these rebels. They offend none but the virtuous. I love them. I praise them. 
Part off. Oh, yes, my lord. Uh, go bear this letter to uh, John, uh, Lord of Lancaster, to my brother John, and this one to Lord of Westmoreland. Go, Pino, to horse, to horse. For thou and I have 30 miles yet to ride before uh, ere dinner, dinner time. Jack, meet me tomorrow in the temple hall at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There shalt thou know thy charge, and there receive money and order for thy furniture. The land is burning. Perseus stands on high. Either we or they ever, we or they must lower lie. Oh, rare words, brave world. Hostess, hostess, my breakfast, come. Oh, I wish this tavern were my drum. <laughs> prices to get in there. If you were a groundling, you paid one pence to get in the door, and you got to stand with 800 other people, some of whom were probably pickpockets, for the entire production. If you could scrounge up an additional pence, you got to go through a different door, which would grant you the privilege of sitting on a backless, hard, wooden bench, but at least you were sitting and you were out of the rain. If you could pay three pence, you got to sit on a far cushier seat with people that were not pickpockets, and you got to watch the show from the best vantage point. There is also power in watching a really well done Shakespeare. And next we're going to see a video clip of Kenneth Branagh <coughs> who is going to be doing a scene from Henry V. This is the scene that is set before the battle of, forgive my French, Agincourt. And the English noblemen are outnumbered easily five or six to one. So they are not feeling particularly good about the battle that's on the horizon. King Henry wishes to rally the troops with one of the most inspiring speeches in history. And despite the odds being so stacked against them, the noblemen really do feel better about their prowess, about the odds, and they're thinking they might just be able to pull this off. So we will now see this clip. Oh, listen for a very familiar phrase in here. It's a very short, very familiar phrase. You'll know it when you hear it in this clip from Henry V. Of fighting men, they have full three score thousand. That's five to one. Besides, they are all fresh. These are fearful arms. Oh, that we've now had here. But one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin was Oh, 
Hold the vigil, feast his neighbors, and say, for tomorrow is St. Crispin's. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars, and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget. Then all shall be forgotten. He'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in their mouths as household words. Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story shall a good man teach his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now are best shall think themselves a curse they were not here, and hold out manhood's cheek, while Denny speaks and thought with us upon St. Crispin Day! <laughs> My sovereign lord, bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set, and will with all expedience march upon us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Punish the man whose mind is backward now. Let us not wish more help from England, Cass. God's will, my liege. Would you and I alone, without our help, can fight this royal battle? <laughs> First, a, a word about Gilbert and Sullivan, which is coming up soon. Um, and in light of uh, the fact that we are being sponsored by the uh, uh, Sister City organization, I just wanted to say I did my first Gilbert and Sullivan role at Durham University in England many, many years ago and became a Gilbert and Sullivan aficionado uh, and lover of Gilbert and Sullivan uh, in that year. So I want to pay tribute to Durham. England for, for, for that. Uh, now to uh, the song, To Sylvia. Uh, to Sylvia, as you know, is one of Schubert's uh, most famous songs of the 600 plus that he wrote. Uh, it, it comes from two gentlemen from Verona, Act Four, uh, that is being sung by Proteus. And he is singing about the virtues and the charms of Sylvia who is the beloved 
of his best friend, not knowing that his best that that uh, that his own beloved is nearby hearing the song that he is singing, assuming it is about some other woman. It all comes out okay in the end. All right. <laughs> so, to Sylvia. <clears throat> sure that after you get a taste of their talents this afternoon, you'll want to see more of them. They perform in the <coughs> spring, and so that show will be coming up with more information to come in a, in, in a few months. So the two men came together at the behest of a producer, Richard Doyley, and he built the Savoy Theater in 1881 to present their joint <coughs> work. So Savoy, Savoyard, you get it. <laughs> and their first piece is going to be, find my notes. First we're 
going to hear, this is from Utopia Limited. There is a little group of isles beyond the waves, and we've got Ruth Weinker, Houston Horn, and the ensemble perform this first piece. Oh, 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 
work influenced the development of musical theater in the 20th century. They also affected political discourse, they were bantering back and forth, subtle political messages in, in the pieces that they've done, and just all, all together fun. <coughs> For the last musical selection, we will depart a bit to Greensleeves, which is an English folk song. The entire ensemble will sing it for us. 
Thank <laughs> you.